Um, what I want, I want to read to you guys some stuff that David and I talked about, and um, I, uh, when I begin to read the conversations, I, um, for purposes of this reading, I took all my questions out, so I, there will just be sort of pauses between what David says and what presumably I would have asked. Um, but before, before I do that, I wanted to um, talk about how I came to write the book, because it sort of, it sort of talks about um, kind of who David was and how his life went up to. Do you guys know the basic facts of David's life? Um, well, but then this next paragraph might be a bit of a rehash. You know, but, um, David was six foot two, and on a good day, he weighed 200 pounds. He had dark eyes, soft voice, caveman chin, a lovely peak-lipped mouth that was his best feature. He walked with an ex-athlete saunter, a roll from the heels, as if any physical thing was a pleasure. He wrote with eyes and a voice that seemed to be a condensed form of everyone's lives. It was the stuff you semi-thought, the background action you, you blinked through at supermarkets and commutes, and readers curled up in the nooks and clearings of his style. His life was a map that ends at the wrong direction. He was an A student through high school. He played football. He played tennis. He wrote a philosophy thesis and a novel before he graduated from Amherst. He went to writing school, published the novel, made a city of squalling, bruising, kneecapping editors and writers, all moony-eyed in love with them. He published a thousand-page novel, received the only award you get in the nation for being a genius, wrote essays providing the best feel anywhere of what it feels like to be alive now, accepted a special chair to teach writing at a college in California, married, published another book, and hanged himself at the age of 46. Um, and that's kind of the way David's story uh, ends. What, what I kind of want to talk about here was, um, was how, sort of how his story begins, how he began writing, and also why I chose to write this book, and kind of why I chose to write it, um, to write it the way I did. Um, David was born, uh, as I'm sure you guys know, in, um, in Ithaca, New York. Um, then he grew up in Illinois. His friend Mark Costello, who was just here for the Mount Graham uh, celebration the other day, uh, met him at Amherst. And he described uh, David as being uh, sort of a word that David had taught Mark. He said that he was a dirt bomb, which was a, uh, Mark described as a slightly tough, slightly waste product -y tennis playing persona. <laughs> Um, what I kept finding in my notes from when I did go on the trip with David, um, I kept writing this note. Looks like he's going to invite you to play hacky sack, and if you say no, there's a potential he'll beat you up. <laughs> this was this sort of a very tall, this extremely tall guy with, a, with an athlete's build and then this incredible eye. Um, and at Amherst, uh, uh, Mark and David became friends. I'm just going to read some stuff that Mark said about that. Yeah, he said that David had figured out, they became friends through the housing lottery. And he said that David had figured out all the math for how to get the best room, the best game theory way to do it. Go in with one other person. Ask for a double, because no one else is going to do that. And then we proceeded to draw the worst number in Western Massachusetts. <laughs> uh, we lived in a single that had been forced into a double right over the dumpsters. <laughs> um, but what, what struck Mark when he first got to know David was that um, was that when they walked across campus, he would see David begin to imitate uh, the way people walked, the way they moved. It wasn't just how they talked. He could somehow, what he said is, not, not to mirror the way, he, he called it the Dave show, watching Dave walk from their dorm um, over the dining hall. He said not to mirror what they did, but to sort of capture them. I can't think of anybody else I've ever met in my life who could do that. Incredibly quick, incredibly funny. Dave had this ability to be inside someone else's skin. Um, and I, we haven't met Dave, or I haven't met Dave yet in this reading, but um, when I later spoke with, uh, with Dave when we were driving around, he told me how he kind of actually started to write. He said one thing, and it's funny how kind of chancy a, a life can be. Mark was writing, and that was one thing. Mark, uh, Mark did a thesis as a senior project, and Dave hadn't been aware you could do that. And so that's actually how he ended up writing his first novel. But he had learned to write, actually. He, he had learned that he could write in a funny way. He, um, <laughs> he said that, I'll just read what he said. Um, he said, I, I'd done some stuff, well, when I was in college, I'd written a couple of papers for other people. Uh, <laughs> because there were a lot of students who, it was kind of neat, um, and I asked, were people paying you to write their papers? And he said, well, I, I wouldn't put it that coarsely. 
but let's say there were complicated systems of reward. <laughs> um, and it didn't happen a whole lot, a whole lot of the time. But I remember one of the things that was interesting was I would kind of read two of their papers to, to learn what their verbal music sounded like. And I remember reading, I remember realizing at the time, man, I'm really good at this. I'm a weird kind of forger. I can sound kind of like anybody. And that was kind of, um, and then he said, uh, it was funny because of Mark having said that he was such a sort of great mimic, he said, it was weird because I remembered that I'd always wanted to be an impressionist vocally, but I just didn't, I didn't have an agile enough a, a vocal and face facial register. Um, then after he got, after he, after he left Amherst, sorry, I know, I know there's a limit to how far I can walk away from the mic anchor. So sorry about that. Um, after that, Amherst, he went to University of Arizona for graduate school. Um, where, and are there any uh, people who've gone to or any graduate school or any graduate students in the audience? Um, so, so, so we are short on graduate students tonight. Um, but oh. I think I found a flaw in the mercantile library of architecture. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, but I, I guess I could practice when I'm this. Um, but uh, David, when he got there, he told me a very funny thing that, um, that when he went there, actually, the, the, uh, the, the faculty didn't enjoy his work, which is something that I always tell the graduate students at MYU, which is that they, um, they began to be sort of hostile to what he was turning in. And one thing that he found sort of terribly uncool about it was the professor said, is this what you intend to do here? It's not what you turned in your portfolio. We'd hate to lose you. <laughs> and he said that what he hated was putting in that sort of passive way as opposed to just making the threat the way he felt they wanted to make it. And then what he found funny was in his last year, um, when he published a, when he published a novel, that they all all the whole faculty started getting sort of very black slappy and saying, "Oh, it's great, you're a U of A man," and he said that, that it, it was it kind of made them sneer at them because they didn't even have the integrity of their contempt, which I thought was really great. Um, so then he came to New York, or he started publishing things, and for uh, if you're if you're a young writer. You're kind of always aware of who the other young writers are, and so um, so we kind of began hearing about people who were young writers who had already come to the city. Began hearing about his work. Um, he when we, again once we still haven't met him in my reading yet, but um, but when we began talking, we talked about what New York was like, and he said he was very happy. He came here for work, but he lived in Bloomington and, and Bloomington Dash Normal, Illinois. And so I was trying to figure out why he didn't live here. And so I quoted something back from Hemingway to him, which is Hemingway was describing New York, and he said, literary New York is like a bottle of tapeworms all trying to feed off each other. <laughs> and, um, and Wallace's response was, yeah, or great white sharks fighting over a bathtub, you know? <laughs> There's so little, the amount of celebrity and money we're talking about is on the scale of true entertainment so small and the formidable intellect marshaled by these egos fighting over the small section of the pie is just, yeah, it seems kind of absurd. And then he said that when he was here, what he heard is just, which is something I always think of when I'm reading the book pages or at certain kinds of parties, I just think of this enormous hiss of egos at various stages of inflation and deflation. <laughs> but, uh, but the way I'm, the, the way that we began hearing about David, uh, he published a great book of stories in 1989, when it turns out he himself was in sort of extremis. And then he began writing um, essays in Harper's, which I think is, is the way a lot of people really came to love his work. Um, and if you were in New York, most people who were writing in New York then, because Harper's was a great place, had friends in <coughs> Harper's, and uh, Harper's had sort of parties, large parties, and if you were a young writer in New York and you know there's gonna be a few hors d'oeuvres and alcohol, <laughs> you will get on that circuit. Um, and so I got to know people there, and the woman who um, the woman who kind of brought David to the magazine, a woman named Charis Khan, uh, told me what it was like when he began publishing these great essays. You guys have read his essays? Mm -hmm. um, the first one he did, the first of these kinds of essays, was a piece called The Ticket to the Fair, which came out in June of 94. Um, and I'll just speak very personally, uh, as a competitive young writer, um, his first book had come out, and it was not, it was funny, but it wasn't warm in a certain way. And, um, and then we all had heard that he had a contract for a novel with Little Brown. 
and then we heard that it had come in much too long and it had been delayed. And so all of us who were sort of in the same unpleasant elbowing each other race were very, very happy. <laughs> um, so when, um, when that first piece came out in Harper's, it was shocking because his work had kind of jumped and it was extraordinarily good. And we had all started hearing a little bit about that before and Charis, I'm just going to quote from Charis in the book. Charis said, um, when a piece ran, staffers would be walking in the hallways trading lines. Or if people, because David was really super sort of charismatic, if people had any conversation with him about any part of it, they would tell each other. It was just the thrill of this writer, everything he had to write and everything he had to say. And then Charis and David became friends and they would walk around New York. And she has a sort of lovely description of him being in the city. Him in New York City, that was a show on its own. Sort of gee whizzing everything, amazed by everything. He was so much smarter than anyone, including you. And yet his attitude was, he was genuinely pleased to be wherever he was most of the time, if he was with a congenial companion, amazed and interested in everything. How could he write what he wrote if he wasn't looking at everything all the time? And you got to be in his senses, so you got to see more. He's using all six and a half senses at once, which can drive you crazy. But he shared it with us, which was nice of him to do. Talking to him was A, a delightful social experience and also a little a literary experience. And then Charis was one of the, the five or six uh, readers who David sent copies of the manuscript to when he finished Infinite Jest. I kind of always loved the way she described that. Um, she had this giant thousand page manuscript and she would read it back and forth on the L train and she would put it on its own seat. <laughs> and people would just walk by and they would just laugh because Charis is a sort of very small person and so the stack was coming up to about her shoulder. And she said it was a spectacle, it was ridiculous. People thought it was funny. I was very proud of it, I loved it. Nobody knew what it was, but it was a nice feeling. Um, and that's kind of around the same time that John Franzen uh, got to know David. Um, the way they became friends. I, you know, one always kind of wonders how sort of famous writers become friends. The way they became friends is that uh, David read uh, John's second novel, uh, Strong Motion, and just sent him a fan letter. And John uh, Franzen arranged uh, a meeting, and uh, what Franzen told me is, Dave just flaked. That was a heavily substance fuel period in his life. Um, but then they became friends after that. And by the mid-90s, they were extremely close. And the way John described the way he valued, the, the valuation he put on David's company was this. I would always use any opportunity to hang out with Dave. And um, when he talked about, when he talked about David visiting the city, when David would visit the city before it just came out, um, his, his bedroom, sort of his hotel, was the spare couch in Franzen's house. And uh, the way Franzen describes this is, when he used to come stay with me, this was before he got his own diet sorted out, as far as I could tell, he subsisted on the cellophane wrapped blondies from delis and chewing tobacco. And the first thing he did when he got to the apartment would be to select the biggest tomato can from my recycling bag and appropriate it. You know, he was very good about only spitting in the can and about washing the can out very carefully and putting it back into the recycling. So the apartment would always have this faintly wintergreen smell of the can after he left. Um, and then, in, January of 96, uh, the cruise ship piece, the second big Harper's piece came out, which was kind of a very shocking moment in the city because it was the first time that sort of a new writer had really made their presence felt for a very long time. It was sort of a new voice. It was, um, the way I thought about it was, was kind of the way you flattered yourself your brain would sound, right? If you just put in the time to organizing and to shelving. Um, but when it was turned into Harper's in the fall of 95, Colin Harrison, who was David's editor there, read it and said, uh, it was very clear to us that we had pure cocaine on our hands. <laughs> um, and that piece came out in January, and then the novel, Infinite Jest, had been edited down. He had edited about 500 pages out with Michael Peach at Little Brown. Um, and it came out a month later. Um, and the whole city was sort of talking about him. We were, uh, we were hearing that he had turned down the Today Show, that he had turned down Charlie Rose, which seemed, you know, in this city particularly, sort of gallant, but very misguided. <laughs> um, we heard rumors about who he was dating. Everyone was talking about him. I remember going to a party at that time. And uh, a friend of mine sat down and said, uh, who's a woman, said, poor David Foster Wallace. You know, every man in this room is going crazy because they all want to be David Foster Wallace because the women in the room, they're all saying they would like to date David Foster Wallace. 
and every writer in general in the city is kind of very upset because he's done what they all wanted to do. And that was sort of fun to be observing from the outside. Um, and then, uh, because his book had been reviewed in the New York Times and they had the photo of him where he wore the bandana and he wasn't totally shaven, uh, I was working at Rolling Stone and the fellow who owns our magazine, uh, Jan Wenner, saw the photo, didn't read the review, but he looked at the, <laughs> looked at the bandana and the long hair and the double and he said, oh, he's one of us. <laughs> so, <laughs> said Lipsky to go, which, um, you know, I wasn't terribly happy about because I love David's work. I've been reading it since the second book. But you don't really necessarily want to be having that experience. Um, I had had, I knew he was going, he'd gone on tour. And he was on sort of a, um, <coughs> he was on a, um, he was on about a three week reading tour. Uh, but I just want to read this because it's very funny. He said, um, he said that uh, it was confusing, I'll just do it from memory. It was confusing to him because he read about the tour, and if you guys know how tours work, you get picked up in different cities, um, and there's an escort. And he said it's confusing because when I read the word escort, I thought like geisha, <laughs> <laughs> who will you know, take you to the interviews, then walk on your back and screw your eyeballs out. <laughs> and instead, what I got were these burly Irishmen who told you their whole life stories before you got to the interview. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, my first book had come out, and um, I knew I, I was reading the press about David, and, um, and I, was, I knew the long tour he was going on, and I had sort of got on tour the year before, which was not a three-week tour. My tour was I, I had traveled 70 blocks, and I had signed bookstore copies, and then my tour complete, I took the subway home and unpacked and recuperated from book tour. <laughs> and the second thing that was kind of hard about it was that my girlfriend was visiting from California and was a huge fan. And this whole, during this whole period from January until March, when I was told to go follow David because he was one of us, um, she was just sitting in, in my bedroom reading his book in this extremely languorous way. <laughs> you know, and every so often, after every hour or two, she'd go to the kitchen to have a cigarette and cool off. <laughs> and uh, while she was there, I just, this is not lovely behavior on my part, but, but I read what was on uh, her computer, uh, her email, and she had written to a mutual friend of ours at Harper's, and I assume because the answer had come back, and the answer from her friend was, Mr. Wallace is cool looking. <laughs> A big hulking guy with long stringy hair, looks sort of like a rock star, perspires freely, <laughs> wears a do-rag, and participates in the urban American experience thusly. Is unmarried, I believe. <laughs> what are your other questions? <laughs> uh, so I was not, I was not incredibly happy. <laughs> To be going to spend um, to be going to spend five days with him, uh, I knew that what we were supposed to do was we were supposed to meet at his house. Then we were supposed to fly to Minneapolis, um, go to his last reading, which was at a bookstore that's now gone called The Hungry Mind, and then fly back to Bloomington. Um, and what what I kind of learned afterwards was um, was it probably wasn't terribly easy for Dave to know that I was coming. Um, there's a lovely thing that he kind of wrote about about being shy or about dealing with meeting people, or particularly getting them to leave. Um, it's, from, uh, it's from that saying, it's sort of the lobster. And I kept thinking about this because I ended up liking Dave so much that I did not want to go home. So, for example, when I actually did come home, um, about five days after I'd gotten back, I got a big package with an Illinois, you know, with an Illinois uh, return address on it. And I was really excited. <laughs> God, he must have really liked me, you know? Um, and what was in there, I opened it up, what was in there was I had left my shoe behind. <laughs> and it was just a note, it was just a little thing on Chicago Bear Stationery saying, yours, I present. Um, but that, that was sort of how much I kind of wanted to stay in. So when I read, uh, years later when I read this, this section of Consider the Lobster, I thought about, and then when he died, uh, I pulled this page down to read to a friend of mine because I wanted them to think about not how David's life ended, which is how amazingly charming and, and alive his eye was. Suppose you and I are acquaintances, he writes, and we're in my apartment having a conversation, and that at some point, I want to terminate the conversation and not have you be in my apartment anymore. <laughs> Very delicate social moment. Think of all the different ways I can try to handle it. Wow, look at the time. 
could we finish this up later? Could you please leave? <laughs> Go. <laughs> Get out. Get the hell out of here. Didn't you say you had to be someplace? <laughs> Time for you to hit the dusty trail, my friend. <laughs> Off you go then, love. Or that sly old telephone conversation ender, well, I'm gonna let you go now. <laughs> In real life, I always seem to have a hard time winding up a conversation or asking somebody to leave. And sometimes, the moment becomes so delicate and fraught with social complexity that I'll get overwhelmed and will just sort of blank and do it totally straight. I want to terminate this conversation and have you not be in my party anymore. <laughs> Which evidently makes me look either as if I'm very rude and abrupt, or as if I'm semi-autistic. <laughs> I've actually lost friends this way. Um, so we, we traveled together for the five days that I was in Illinois and Minnesota. Um, and I, when, the, when it was over, I came back to the piece, and it was sort of a hard piece to think about writing because there are very few times when you'll write about another writer when you actually have sat in the chair that they're gonna sit to read, it, to read it in. And so it was really hard to be sitting down and beginning to do this profile in March of 96, and then uh, luckily um, there'd been some heroin uh, troubles in Seattle. And so I got reassigned to that story. And then when I came back, I was told, you know, you know, you'll write the piece about David once you return. And when I got back and finished the story, it was about a month and a half afterwards, and it was too late, so I never had to write the piece. Um, but I would keep reading the transcript of the time we spent together when you, this is much more exciting. Than <laughs> um, but I kept reading the piece, and then when David died in September of 2008, um, I kind of wanted to do it. Um, I wanted to think of a way to kind of um, to kind of remind people of what he was like when he was alive. And his sister had written me uh, an email, and she was being contacted by sort of reporters, and she was being contacted by fans and writers. And she said that my own anxieties are many. My brother was a hilarious guy, a quirky, generous spirit who happened to be a genius and suffer from depression. There was a lot of happiness in his life. He loved to be silly. He made exquisite fun of himself and others. Part of me still expects to wake up from this, but everywhere I turn is proof that he's really most sincerely dead. Will he be remembered as a real living person? And the other reason that I wanted to write this book the way it's written, which is just after the introduction, which runs about 30 pages, it's just me and David talking. So in a certain sense, it's more of a performed book than, than a written book, um, is that David, when, when we sat down, was very anxious about, about the idea of someone writing about him, and he kept saying to me things like, you know, the problem is once you're at your desk, you'll be able to construct anything you want. And in our first conversation, he said, because if you want it, you know, within the parameters of, you can't tell outright lies, which I'll then deny to the fact checker, but if you want it, you're gonna be able to shape this essentially how you want. And that, to me, is extremely disturbing, because I wanna to try to be able to shape and manage the impression of me that's coming across. And so for that reason, uh, after David's death, when I was thinking about ways to write about him, it seemed the best thing to do was just take the five days that we spent together and turn them into a book with as little, with as little input from me really as possible. Um, I wanted to read to you guys uh, a couple of selections from that book. Um, the first one is, um, the first one is about, um, is about the period. Uh, I mentioned that his second book was written sort of an extremis. Um, when he he had gone to well, I'll just I'll just let David start speaking in a second. But he had graduated from he graduated from Arizona. He had gotten a second book together. It was about to come out, and he had decided to go to a different graduate program at the same time. Um, and during all this time, I really I mean I was really in a panic because I didn't think I was going to be able to write anymore. And I got this idea that I'd started writing while being a student, and writing was recreational from the student work. And what I'd do is contrive a situation where I applied to Princeton and Harvard in philosophy. Got a very sweet deal from Harvard, so went there early in 89 and moved into Boston, into this apartment with my friend Mark Costello. And it sounds weird, but it was, I, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know whether I really loved to write, or whether I'd just gotten kind of excited after having some early success. And I remember getting really unhappy. And it sounds weird, 
but I think it was almost more of a like sort of an artistic and religious crisis than it was anything you would call a breakdown. I just, all my reasons for being alive and the stuff that I thought was important just truly at a gut level weren't working anymore. Does this make sense to you personally at all? You see, by this time, my ego is all invested in the writing, right? It's the only thing that I've gotten, you know, food pellets from the universe for, to the extent that I wanted. And it was also, I really sort of felt like my life was over at 27 or 28, and I didn't want to, and that felt really bad, and I didn't want to feel it. And so I would do all kinds of things. I mean, I would drink real heavy. I would date strangers, oh God. Or then for two weeks, I wouldn't drink, and I'd run 10 miles every morning. You know that kind of desperate, like very American, I will fix this somehow by taking radical action. And it's weird, I think a lot of it comes from sports training, you know, and then he did a pretty good Arnold Schwarzenegger imitation. So I'll be imitating him imitating Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> if so as a problem, I will train my way out of it. I will get up earlier, I will work harder. And that crap worked on me when I was a kid, but you know. And then he found that he he went to uh, to the Harvard to the Harvard Health Center and self-reported and was sent to McLean Hospital, which is a psychiatric hospital outside the city. Uh, and there's a lot of places in Boston, but McLean, actually I did end up at McLean because that's what the Harvard insurance was on the plan for. And I'm not concerned about, I mean, I don't mind having somebody know I was on suicide watch in McLean. I'm concerned, I, I don't want to make this into a romantic, lurid, tormented artist thing. This was more just I think I had lived an incredibly American life that, boy, if I could just achieve X and Y and Z, everything would be okay. And I think I had really, I think I got very, very lucky. I got to have a midlife crisis at 27, which at the time didn't seem lucky. Now it seems to me fairly lucky. That period, nothing before or since has ever been that bad for me. And I am willing to make enormous sacrifices never to go back there. Um, I mentioned that, uh, that one of the characters in Infinite Jest, a character named Kate Galberts, had sort of been in a similar situation, given shock, and he said, he answered, the thing about shock is I never had shock and they never gave me shock, but I realized, I realized I sort of got an idea of the continuum I was on, you know, and at one side was the way I usually was, and I could see there's a fair amount of stuff in the book about depression that is not, it's not exactly autobiographical. But it's looking, I think, about a quarter mile further down the road. I mean, I could see the filter dropping over my vision, you know? I could see the distortions. Um, and I admit I had a grim fascination with this stuff. I'm not biochemically depressed, but I feel like I got to dip my toe in that wading pool, and um, not going back there is more important to me than anything. It's like worse than anything. I don't know if you've had any experience with this. It's worse than any kind of physical injury or any kind of it may be what in the old days was called a spiritual crisis. It's just feeling as though the entire, every axiom of your life turned out to be false, and there was actually nothing, and you were nothing, and it was all a delusion, and that you were better than everyone else because you saw that it was a delusion, and yet you were worse because you couldn't function. And it was just, it was just horrible. And trying to be at Harvard, and to read Freedom of the Will with John Rawls while thinking this way was just extremely unpleasant. And I decided that I need, I really need to find a few things that I believe in in order to stay alive. And one of them is that this is, that I'm extraordinarily lucky to be able to do this kind of work. And that along with that luck comes a tremendous obligation to do the very best I can. And which means I have to structure my life sort of like anybody who's dedicated to something to maximize my ability to do good stuff. And it's just like, it doesn't make me a great person. It just makes me a person who's, who's exhausted a couple other ways to live, you know, and really taken them, taken them to their conclusion, which for me was a pink room with no furniture and a drain in the center of the floor, which is where they put me for an entire day when they thought I was going to kill myself, where you don't have anything on and somebody's observing you through a slot in the wall. And when that happens to you, you get tremendous, you get unprecedentedly willing to examine the other alternatives for how to live. Um, and then I wanted to read to you, uh, while he was there, he was living at that time with Mark Costello in a tremendously ratty apartment. And so once he'd come on suicide watch, he called Mark and asked Mark to, um, 
to drive by the hotel, uh, to the hospital rather, and bring up some stuff. And uh, so this is Mark Costello talking. It was a scary place. The first night he went in there, this is Dave, right? Kind of, you know, he is a guy who does have his comforts, right? So the first night he goes in there, really with the yawning chasm of existentialism underneath him, but he also calls me and says, you coming out? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Here are some things I need. Every little thing. So he had a bathrobe that he really liked, terry cloth bathrobe that was really comfortable. And he wanted his TV. And he, of course, wanted 25 cartons of cigarettes and some other stuff, too. That might have been some work. It's like, yeah, you're going to get a lot of work done in there. So I parked the car at McLean's, which, if you've ever seen it, it's sort of like the Munsters. It's on a sort of gated parkway with gables and stuff. And I don't have enough arms to carry all the stuff. But I put on the bathrobe because I can't carry it. And then I pick up the other stuff. And then I go into the wrong building. I go into the psychotic, the really sort of dangerous psychotic building. And they think I'm an escape psychotic. Uh, I say to the woman, I'm here to see Dave Wallace. And he's not in existence there because it's the wrong building. <laughs> and she's like, okay, okay, now just stay calm. <laughs> uh, I turn around and there's two Belmont cops, you know, security guards. They step in the way they kind of open up four feet of space. And I'm like, no, really. I'm a guy in a bathrobe carrying a TV. <laughs> but I'm not crazy. So it takes a while to work that out until I get to see Dave. And I get there late and I explain what happened. And he, of course, thought, wow, you are a real fool. <laughs> he loved that and he loved that it happened to me, certainly. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about what David was like before I talked about what he did, kind of um, what he did after, after getting out of McLean. Um, just changing the view on this. Um, which is very funny, there was almost nothing, there was almost, traveling with him was uh, about as much fun as I've had traveling with anybody or ever talking to anybody, he was just incredibly awake. Um, I remember we went in to, uh, we went in to record, uh, I went in to sit in the audience, and uh, David went in to record a thing on NPR in Minneapolis, and, um, and the guy who was going to be interviewing him said, we're going to be recording digitally, I hope that's okay, and David responded, so yes and no answers only. <laughs> Which I thought was a brilliant joke, and I wrote it down. And David turned and said, um, you know, if you write anything really bad about me, I have 20 years to get you back. Um, or or when, we, um, when, we checked into the, uh, when we checked into the hotel, um, the desk clerk said, you know, your, your room has two twins. And David quickly said, imagine telling a story that has the phrase, and David quickly said, and David quickly said, yes, Anita and Consuela. <laughs> I just, it was, um, when we were, we were having, um, we were stuck in the airport, when we tried to go to Minneapolis for the reading, which we were going to, we were supposed to travel in the morning and get to the reading that night, um, they had been iced over, so it was, we were just stuck, and we decided to have sort of breakfast there, and what I ordered was the sort of big burger deluxe thing. And he looked at it and said, I am not even going to start on the idea of eating a hamburger at 7 in the morning. <laughs> uh, the idea is that you eat eggs, which are kind of a latent form, as your body itself is, awaken is awakening. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense because you are the food and you're supposed to eat stuff that's nice to you. And then at night, you can eat, you know, as you move towards the end of the day, you can eat partially decomposed creatures.